He is the one and only Professor Richard Wolf, always a popular guest on this show. Professor Wolf, uh, welcome back. Before I turn to the economy and the BRICS, let me take the temperature with you on uh, how the American gerontocracy reached the stage that it evidently has reached in these last couple of days. Now, I'm not ageist. How can I be? I'm getting older myself. And I just congratulated Mick Jagger on how he moves at the age of 80. He certainly moves a lot better than Mitch McConnell appears to be moving. What conclusion or observation would you make about that? Well, you know, the United States, like the United Kingdom, is a country whose hegemonic empire is now part of its past. And like the British, the Americans are not going quietly or gracefully or gently into the decline of their particular economic system and their particular uh, empire. And so it is very fitting in its own bizarre way for the oldest amongst us, those who have lived for the longest time in the empire period of the United States to be holding on for dear life, because that really represents what the United States as a society is now doing, trying to hold on to what it once was in the face of the bricks of China, of a changing global South that really is now in the ascendancy in a way that almost everyone can see. And the United States is afraid to embrace the need for change. And so it holds on to the ancient and oldest symbols of what it once was. A metaphor of which Shakespeare himself would have been pleased to draw. Uh, let's turn to the BRICS, uh, this uh, hegemonic shift. Uh, that we see in front of us. You say everyone can see it, but I suspect most Americans can't see it. I know that most British people can't see it. Uh, they don't even know that Britain 50 years ago uh, ceased to be uh, a significant player in, in world events, except as the tail of the American dog. And I suspect the same is true in your country too. But in the rest of the world, judging by the queue of people now forming, to join the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Everyone else can read the writing on the wall, Professor. Yes, and they and you know, part of my job here as a, as a United States uh, person, I teach and work here, has been to try to catch up the American population uh, to become perhaps a population that can learn from what previous empires could not do to embrace the reality and come to terms with it. It is the judgment of many of us that the war uh, in, the U in Ukraine has more to do with the United States attempt to control, to limit, uh, to contain the People's Republic of China than anything else. Uh, and that it's a hopeless effort. It is not working. It will not work. You're not going to change uh, the tectonic shifts that are going on in the world today. I mean, I, I try to remind people that as we speak, the total GDP of the BRICS is about 33% of world production compared to that of the G7, the United States and its allies, that is about 29%. I mean, they're not even equal anymore. The BRICS have moved ahead. They're growing faster than the G7, uh, to say the least. Uh, the writing is on the wall. The direction is crystal clear. And it would be a lot wiser and a lot more respectful of human life to stop the war in Ukraine, to stop the killing and destruction of those people there by sitting down and reaching 
a, a settlement that everyone can live with because the alternative, this attempt to move against the, the process of history is, is simply uh, a, a crazy effort that should be rejected by people who understand finally what the reality is. Now, uh, before we come back to the BRICS and the currency issue, uh, I wondered what your view was about the, on the face of it, extraordinary odyssey of a 100-year-old man. I mean, he makes Mitch McConnell uh, look like a young lad. Uh, Henry Kissinger took a 14-hour flight to Beijing, was treated like a visiting president of the United States rather than a centenarian private citizen. What do you think that trip was all about? Well, I think uh, as someone who has spent a good bit of time studying China, I think what, what the point, at least from the Chinese perspective, was that Henry Kissinger will be remembered for having arranged the trip back in the early 1970s uh, of himself and the then President Nixon to go to China to renew uh, diplomatic relations, to give up on the failed program of isolating China as a way to repress it that did not work. And Kissinger and Nixon knew it. it. All it did was to give the Japanese and the Europeans a privileged access to China because the United States wouldn't uh, do it. This was self you know self destructive as american policy but the real purpose i think was to say kissinger represents a coming to terms with a rising china it represented an agreement to work together in the world trade organization and in a number of other places to kind of live and let live you might call it peaceful economic coexistence. And over the subsequent 40 years, the 1980s through our time, the Chinese economy boomed and the United States economy boomed. They didn't destroy each other. They were able to live together and to prosper together. And I think for the Chinese, watching the shift in the United States and Europe towards more and more economic nationalism, the Chinese see that as less of a world to grow in than the one that Nixon and Kissinger opened up. And it was therefore a none too subtle appeal for a new Kissinger to come forward and continue the peaceful coexistence because to be honest, it worked even better for China than it did for the United States and quite and by quite a, a, a big a difference. It is amazing, uh, given your views and mine on Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, that we can look back on their age, at least in that regard, as being an age of greater wisdom in foreign affairs, uh, isn't it? Yep. They were driven in that time to, to make a break. It was so obvious that it wasn't working that we can be hopeful, as I believe uh, Xi Jinping probably was, hopeful that maybe again a more realistic administration uh, in Washington, uh, not out of a notion of global peace, that's more than we can hope for, but out of a notion of the comparative advantage for the United States, uh, warfare with China is a dead end, nuclear war is a complete end, and short of that, you're not going to turn the Chinese around. Mr. Trump's tariff war didn't do it. Mr. Trump's trade war didn't do it. Uh, the war in Ukraine didn't do it. Uh, Janet Yellen's trip last week didn't do it. I mean, how many times do you have to see that there's a dead end where you are going before someone makes a career out of saying, hmm, the emperor doesn't have any clothes, so let's get him a genuine outfit.
Now, turning back to the BRICS, Professor, uh, there's great anticipation uh, of the forthcoming BRICS summit. Uh, almost every African leader will be there. It's being held in South Africa. Uh, the members of the BRICS, of course, and the long queue of applicant members, associate members, observer members, and so on. All roads lead to South Africa uh, in August for the BRICS. What do you think substantially will be decided there? I have in mind in particular this, on the face of it, extraordinary proposal to create a BRICS currency, a gold and commodities backed currency. That would uh, turn uh, the apple cart over, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. And I think uh, we are struck here in the United States that among the countries seeking to become members of BRICS are a significant number of Latin American company, uh, countries. And I think that's a sign, if anything, of the weakening ability of the United States to control uh, what is happening. Here's my suggestion. Third world countries, as we used to call them, countries of the global south, which is the preferred term these days, have a new world where before their economic development plans would lead them sooner or later to the West, to the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. They now have, and they've had it now for two or three years, a real alternative. The BRICS is an alternative. China above all, is an alternative. The Chinese can give you a loan. The Chinese can help you build a railroad. The Chinese can buy what you sell and sell to you what you need. You, you have a, an a opportunity to play off one against the other, uh, the West and the East, the G7 and the BRICS. And this opens up a realm of possibilities, the likes of which the global South hasn't seen uh, for, for literally for centuries. And so it's an incredible time uh, of change in the world that the West and, and even the East cannot control since it's the majority of the world that is beginning to have real options and introduce them into global uh, politics. And nothing could be more emblematic of that than the turning away from the dollar. There, the decision of Saudi Arabia a few months ago to begin pricing oil in yuan and in other currencies, not just the dollar, was an absolutely crucial turning point, which has expanded ever since then. And with the dollar no longer having the dominant role it once did, and with the emergence now of real alternative currencies and proposals for currencies, again, the line of change is obvious. The decline of the dollar means a decline of any other currency hoping to replace the dollar, such as the euro or even the Chinese yuan, because it's becoming a multipolar world and all many interests are going to be involved. And the sooner countries can reorganize their strategies and tactics, the more successful they will be. The Chinese are ahead of the Americans. The Americans are ahead of the Europeans, but my my advice, if anyone wants it, is this train has left the station, it's well on its way, it's going to be the future, and the sooner you come to terms with the changing global currency and everything else, the better off you'll be. And the longer you fight against it, the longer you have to be the old empire desperately trying to hold on, the worse the outcome when it comes will be.